likely, very likely, they've never been in a car before uh, or ever driven uh, to a spot out here. They've always gone by foot. All right, let's take a look. The Tuareg man would like to, but opening a car door is as alien to him as riding a camel would be yep. for Paul. There you go. anything more here. Waiting to see. Is that vertebrae and some limb bones? Limb bone frags. Look, I mean, it looks fairly weathered. Can we have a brush? Alien dinosaur. The bones are badly weathered, and Paul knows from a previous trip that better specimens and the chance for a skull lay further down the cliff line. That's definitely a dinosaur. Still, it's never wise to ignore a tip from a local. You're working against the odds. So, you know, you, you, take, you take whatever you can get. If somebody says uh, they, they, they think they can take you to some bones and it's not taking you uh, miles and miles off course and, uh, and you believe the guy, you might even go miles and miles off course. I mean, you take whatever you can get. Another Tuareg man has led them here to a spectacular desert cove. This is where they hope they'll finally solve the riddle of the headless wonder. Nice There's another one. Yep. That looks... That's very weathered. Therapodium? That looks therapodium. As the local here called it, down Dinosaur Graveyard. He's the one who brought us to this place and said, yeah, I can show you the dinosaur graveyard. It took him a while to prove to us that it was, but he found that one skeleton, and then we've been spreading out and found quite a few. And, and it's, it's rich in pockets. This area, the way we watch walk from the vehicles, is just loaded. After hours of skullless prospecting, they decide to pack it in and return to camp for lunch. But then, only 25 feet from the vehicle, in fact, so close they could have backed over it, they make an amazing find. Yeah, oh. Holy sh... <laughs> yeah, but wait a minute. Is that it? <laughs> oh, it could be fishy? Um, Is that the long-lost skull? No, let's not jump to... Rash conclusions to wow. be nice though. Perhaps the most amazing thing is that anyone could identify this crumbling pile of rocks as the is, skull it's, it's, of it's anything. It, it's but after weeks in the field, their eyes are trained to see what few others could. And, and piecing this together with what we have, I think that um, the animal's got a skull. It's fantastic. Wow. Which is it? Oh. The Which head is, is resting upside Sorry, down, the with the bottom the protruding from the earth. Most of it is beneath the soil, but would look like this when intact. Two feet long, a foot and a half high. It's the last piece to the puzzle. You know, to come so close and realize that, okay, you've got 55 feet or 57 feet of this animal, but you're missing the last foot, and that's a very important foot, was, uh, was something that was weighing very heavily on me. But no more. Their dogged persistence has paid off. They have now found every major bone of a completely new species of dinosaur. Now, they've got to name it. I thought it would be a neat idea to um, name this animal, whatever that the, the Tuaregs themselves call it, if they call it anything sp specific other than um, old bones. And so I had been asking some of our guardians if they knew um, the name that the, uh, the, pe the the, uh, the Tuaregs around here called the animal, and uh, Ima here uh, knew the name of what they call this, the exact name for what they call this large sauropod animal, and it's Jobar. They would recognize it if you came up and said, what's that? They would say it's Jobar. And we could combine that in some sense with a generic name, as, as Jeff was suggesting, with um, uh, what they would all agree is the place name. But well, we're going to think about it a little bit more, but I think that's a, a good start on a name. The official name, Jobaria tigidensis, or mythical beast of the Tigiti Cliff, is a gesture of respect to the people of the region. But Paul is bound to do more. We have an agreement with the government of Niger. The people of Niger, you say, what are you going to do for Niger? 
Well, we're going to work out the science of the animal, but that's not going to do a lot for Niger. But we are under obligation now, and, I, and I, it's a challenge. We have signed on to reconstruct this animal and make it walk again in less than a year and a half, and that's our obligation. A complete copy of the dinosaur will be given to the people of Niger. But before they can even think about that, there's the little matter of getting all 25 tons of Jobaria back to Paul's lab in Chicago. Then they'll begin the mammoth task of making the animal stand up for the first time in 135 million years. One and a half years later, Paul has traded desert vistas for a more familiar skyline. If he faced a difficult challenge in the desert, he faces an even tougher one now. That's because Sereno now plans to reconstruct not one, but two massive Jobaria skeletons. And the deadline for unveiling them is only two months away. Maybe it's not the best time for a jog. But Paul isn't running for his health. He's running for money. Every day for the last few months, he's been training for the Chicago Marathon. Someone has said that if you can finish this marathon and beat uh, some other celebrities, uh, will help you do whatever you want to do. And what I want to do is build this dinosaur. If Paul can beat the other celebrities in the race, he can win money to help build it. One little detail. Paul has never run a long-distance race before, much less a 26-mile marathon. Reconstructing hundreds of dinosaur bones and running a marathon are a lot more similar than some of Paul's students would like to think. Paul and the team brought back more than 50,000 pounds of jacketed bones. First, the bones are extracted from the plaster and then meticulously cleaned and prepared for casting. The bone cleaning marathon has lasted for months. The goal of paleontology isn't to create mounted models of skeletons. It's to understand the animal's bones and what they tell us about evolution. So why mount the skeletons at all? I think the whole process of mounting these animals is a fantastic part of my job and part of this work and part of the study because, you know, our inquisitiveness doesn't end with uh, the clean bone. Paul has chosen a controversial position for the mount, featuring two Jobaria with the larger one in a rearing pose. You look at that skeleton, you're going to say, wow. Uh, and I think, I think it's going to immediately um, raise questions in your mind. Could these animals really move like that? Could an animal rear on its hind limbs? I wanted to say a lot, not only aesthetically, but scientifically, that we think this animal could do this, and we're going to try to prove it. He has to prove it because he's a scientist. After all, he's not creating some kitschy decoration for a miniature golf course. These models have to be scientifically accurate. So to prove that the dinosaur can rear, they have to figure out several things. First, were Jobaria's bones strong enough to support the awesome weight of the dinosaur when it reared? We can't wait to see this. The answer may be in this basement. That was the first thing I asked Jeff to try and figure out. Can the bones handle it? To me, they look big, but the animal is enormous. Model of the hind limb. Wow. Uh, Expedition member Jeff Ogrodnik is also a civil engineer. He has built a simple chain and two by four model of Jobaria's leg to figure out what forces were at work on the thigh bone. This is the pelvis and hind limb. Right. So how these uh, chains represent the muscles that support the uh, bones. Uh, when the animal's standing upright, or uh, on four legs, the muscle really doesn't have to provide much uh, tension in order to provide stability. But as soon as you uh, reorient the femur to rear back, it's subjected to a lot greater load. Yeah, I see the chain. Wow. You can see the chain flexes up, uh -huh. becomes a lot tighter. Simulate. When the adult Jobaria stood with its legs straight, the leg bones carried a load of over 13,000 pounds. 
That's the equivalent weight of three pickup trucks. The center of mass but when the animal reared back, it created an incredible amount of bending force on the thigh bone, easily enough force to snap a nearly one-foot diameter tree trunk like a toothpick. But Jobaria's bones were built to take it. In fact, Jeff's calculations and model revealed that the bones were so massive, they could have handled three times that force. Maybe our impression of sauropods as big, plodding donut eaters was wrong. Jobaria seems to have been tremendously athletic and strong. Paul now knows the bones could handle it, but wants to actually see how it was done. For that, there's nothing quite like working with a real sauropod. Really moves. Oh yeah, yeah, he moves. Or at least the next best thing. What he's capable of and how he's capable of moving. Okay, son, move up. Paul and Jeff have come to the Bowmanville Zoo in Ontario, Canada. This is one of the oldest private zoos in North America and home to a huge African elephant named Angus. It's the closest we can ever get to anything on the scale of what we're studying. And it's just fabulous to actually be right up next to it and touch it. Okay, Angus, you ready? Stand by. So Angus, stand by means get ready to do the behavior. Stand Zoo by. director oh. and trainer Mike Hackenberger is helping them figure out how Angus shifts his weight back in order to rear. All right, feet, which is up to the front feet, feet and stand. See how he puts his weight underneath them? Oh. And see how wow. it goes? See how wow. Lift, lift, lift. Oh. All right, well done. Good boy. Wow. Now we can do this a couple times. Seeing today. Angus stand on his hind limbs once isn't enough. Um, you can see the skin does all this stuff. How so often do you get the chance to work with a mini sauropod? The angle and how it's positioned while he's standing up. Right here. This way we can track the movement of the hind limb as it. Yeah, draw a complete line. Okay. Yeah. It's hard for me to imagine a sauropod in the position that we've put it in without a living animal at least this size to gauge our speculations on. Jeff and I have put, uh, it's amazing how easy he does this. It's just <laughs> this is an animal that's going to have to lay eggs. It's an animal that is going to be pushing against its rivals. It's an animal that's going to have to mate and reproduce. And these all assume different positions than simply just walking at a slow pace on four legs. Could sauropods do that? That's, our, that's what we're trying to get at. It, it's striking how easy it is for the elephant to do this because it's actually an enormous feat. I mean, when you, when you look at the elephant, it's got uh, not only its weight centered over its forelimb, but it's got this uh, uh, huge head and uh, no, no balancing tail. And yet, by properly redistributing its weight, it really doesn't have much of a problem lifting off the ground in a hind leg stand. Can you do it one more time? I'm just I'm curious how much he's bending before he actually lifts off. It's not very really much on the tail. See, he, he, yeah, it's not. It's right as he lifts off. Lift, lift. Angus proves that big animals can do lots of things we wouldn't expect. Good boy. Oh. Including some maneuvers which have no known function in the wild. Head down, lift, hold, oh. hold, hold it, hold it. All right, well done. Good boy, very good. Nice job. <laughs> they need to do a little tree eating here. We're extremely curious as to where the center of mass of this animal is and how much weight it has on its fore limb versus its hind limb. So, how do you figure that out? The answer is at the local truck stop. Okay, what's that? Angus will stand with his front axle over one part of the scale and his rear axle over the other. Maybe have it straddle the crack. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Now they can figure out just how much weight is carried by each set of limbs. Okay, good boy. Hey, no. Hey, 60-40. 60-40? 60% of the weight of the animal is front is held by the fore limbs and only 40% by the rear. So that's like the exact opposite of our sauropod. This is the confirmation they needed. 
Since Jobaria carried most of its weight over its hind limbs, it follows that it would be even easier for it to rear than it would be for Angus. Paul is now convinced that constructing the model in the rearing pose is sound. But building it is one of the hardest parts of this marathon. Before they can reconstruct,